Hey everyone and welcome to a new video brought to you by Lantern Education. My name is Marcus and today we're going to focus on another part of the IB biology syllabus. So the focus of today's video will be DNA and some very important biochemical processes that are occurring with DNA, also with RNA, so all of our nucleic acids. If you haven't really got an idea yet of what you know your nucleic acids are, what is DNA, what is RNA, what does that even stand for, please go back to watch the video on organic compounds. It's a good video in general, and towards the end, I'm discussing nucleic acids there, sort of the, the basic building blocks of nucleic acids, which are called nucleotides, what they're made up of, and that'll be very central to understand before you can watch this video. If you already know this and want to review DNA replication, translation and transcription, so those three very important processes, then this video is right for you. And we're going to jump right in with the first of these processes. Just one important point before we get started. All of the processes, DNA replication, transcription and translation, you will need to know for SL, but for HL, just like it happened before with the cellular respiration and photosynthesis processes, you will need to know more if you're taking HL. You will need to know sort of the which enzymes are working here, what are the, again, biochemical details. And so in today's video, it's for HL and SL students and we're covering everything, sort of the broad strokes. And then in a future video, we will focus on the nitty gritty details of what's really going on there, which again, can be watched by SL and HL students, but only HL students are required to actually then in the end, remember these details for the exam. Another video that I made a couple of weeks ago was focused on mitosis. So that is the replication of the cells, the somatics so the body cells everywhere in the organism. And so mitosis replicating a cell, so creating two identical daughter cells, from a cell that was there before by literally splitting it apart, relies on one very central process going on in the nucleus before we can actually go into mitosis. I mentioned that in the video before. And that process is DNA replication, because of course, in order to carry out all the functions that a cell needs to carry out, you need to have a blueprint of what to do. And that's DNA, right? That's the genetic information, that's, how we, that's what we can call it. And this genetic information stored in DNA needs to be given to the daughter cells once one cell divides. Again, that's called mitosis. And so DNA replication is required for that. So we're replicating the DNA in order to then divide the cell. And so that's our first process here that we're gonna look at today. The first important thing to know about DNA replication is that it is semi-conservative. What does that mean? Semi is always a sort of prefix we can put in front of a word, and semi means half. So it is half conservative. What does conservative mean? Well, conservative is always keeping something the same, right? And so half conservative means we're keeping half of it the same. And that's exactly what happens here. So the semi-conservative replication means we have our DNA. So it's two strands. Of course, they're wound in a double helix, but just for showing purposes here, we're just gonna pretend it's just two strands here. And as you know, there are bases, right? The nitrogenous bases, and they are connected in the DNA backbone. So it's, it's more of like a ladder here, right? And now what happens is we are gonna cut through this ladder. So there are hydrogen bonds connecting the nitrogenous bases and we're gonna cut through them with an enzyme. And then we have separated our two strands of DNA. What we can do now is find the nucleotides that match because we have complementary base pairing. You can't just match any of the bases here. You need to have the right ones. By complementary base pairing, we can then recreate these DNA strands. So let's look at just this one. We will look what bases are here and we will add the corresponding nucleotides using complementary base pairing so that then in the end we have, this was our original strand, we created a new double-stranded DNA. And we're going to do the same here. So that in the end, again, we started out with these two, blue and silver, and then we now have these two. And so it's called semi-conservative because we kept for each of the two new strands 
half of it is old. We separated the DNA, we kept half, and we synthesized half of it new by adding new nucleotides using complementary base pairing. And now it's already done. We have replicated the DNA. We went from one DNA strand, double-stranded, to two new double-stranded DNA molecules. Again, as a reminder for you, in complementary base pairing, we can connect adenine and thymine, so A and T, using hydrogen bonds, and we can connect cytosine and guanine, so C and G. Those are the only possible base pairings in DNA. When we go to RNA, it's going to look a little different, but this is what happens here in replication, right? We're only looking at DNA for the moment. So these are the base pairings that are possible, creating this ladder of DNA using hydrogen bonds. And now I want to briefly talk about the enzymes that we use for this process. So the first one I already mentioned, it is called DNA helicase. And that enzyme is responsible for, first of all, unwinding the helix so that we actually look at kind of this structure, right? Just two strands that are not wound in the double helix. And then second of all, it also, as I mentioned before, breaks those hydrogen bonds connecting the nitrogen spaces, thereby connecting the two strands. And so once DNA helicase is done, we have separated the strands at a specific location so that we can then semi-conservatively replicate the two strands. So again, the two strands then work as a template for replication. And then our enzyme that actually does the work is called DNA polymerase. And again, polymerase, you can sort of see poly in there. Poly means many. And so it is the enzyme, and again, ASE at the end, can already tell you it's an enzyme. So DNA polymerase is the enzyme that makes a polymer, so a long molecule. How does DNA polymerase do that? Well, there are so-called deoxynucleoside triphosphates. So what does that very long word mean? Well, it's sort of like a nucleotide, but it's not quite there. Because as you know, a nucleotide has one phosphate group, but a deoxynucleoside triphosphate has three phosphate groups. And so DNA polymerase cleaves off two of those phosphates. And as you know, phosphate groups are good for sort of transferring energy. And cleaving off these two phosphates gives us the energy that we need to connect. And each deoxynucleoside triphosphate has one of four bases, right? Adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. They can only match with their corresponding partner, as we mentioned earlier. And then DNA polymerase cleaving off two of the phosphates creates a nucleotide that can be added using the energy given off by cleaving off the two phosphate groups. Something important to note here, which we're not going to get into now, but will definitely feature in the next video that is for HL students, is that, of course, it happens in two opposite directions, right? We separate the two strands, and then DNA polymerase can only work in one direction. So it works in this direction here, and in this direction here. And that actually creates a situation that is a bit complicated for one of the two strands. And we'll look at that again in the other video. For now, DNA helicase and DNA polymerase are the two enzymes to remember. And the others that, you know, when it gets a bit more complicated, we'll look at another time. So now we're already jumping into our next process, which is transcription and translation. Transcription and translation are sort of two processes, but they depend on one another and they're part of a bigger thing, which is protein synthesis, because there is something called the central dogma of biology. So that is something that is at the core of everything that's going on. And that central dogma is we have DNA, we can get RNA from our DNA template. That process is transcription. And then from RNA, we can go to proteins. So we can actually synthesize, we can make proteins from the RNA template. And that process is translation. So you can sort of think about it in the way that DNA and RNA are nucleic acids. They're very similar. So we're just transcribing something. We're taking the DNA code. So the code means the sequence of nitrogenous bases, right? That's the DNA code. That's what distinguishes one section of DNA from another. And we're transcribing that 
into RNA, so into a different nucleic acid, RNA being single-stranded. Now we have to translate because we're going from one sort of language to another, because we're going from a nucleic acid to a protein. That is a very big change. So this is translation then, that process, going from RNA to a protein. And in that process, we are converting, so our two languages are kind of the code of RNA in, stored in the RNA at that point, so the nitrogenous basis, and then we're translating that into a sequence of amino acids, right? Because proteins, of course, are made up of amino acids, and one protein is different from another protein because of the sequence of amino acids. So now let's look at these two things, transcription and translation, which together get us to this very important point of we're going from DNA, so that's our genetic material, and then we're actually making something out of it and we're making proteins. And as you know, and if you don't, please go back to the video on organic compounds. Proteins are central everywhere. Hormones are proteins sometimes. Protein is in your hair. Enzymes, of course, are proteins and they're needed for all metabolic processes. And so uh, it's very, very central to get these proteins to get things done. Now that we already know replication, transcription is actually similar, but there's one important difference. In transcription, we're not transcribing the entire stretch of DNA, we're just transcribing one gene. So again, one gene is a sequence of the DNA that codes for a protein. So we're starting at one location, we go to another lo location, and then it's over, it's not the entire DNA strand. And again, we need an enzyme, and this one is called RNA polymerase. Again, very similar to what happens in replication just here, it's RNA polymerase. And of course, as you know, RNA is single-stranded. So what happens is we're just making one single strand, not the double-stranded DNA structure that we saw before. So RNA polymerase unwinds the double helix at a specific location, then separates the two strands of DNA, and then it synthesizes the adding of ribonucleoside triphosphates in order to create the RNA molecule. What are ribonucleoside triphosphates? Well, they're very similar to deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates that we saw in replication. It's just that here, because RNA has a different pentose sugar, it's ribose instead of deoxyribose. They're called ribonucleoside triphosphates. And just as it happened before, we have the two of three phosphates being cleaved off by RNA polymerase and thereby setting off the energy that we need to actually add them together. Another very central point here is that in the ribonucleoside triphosphates, which then become the nucleotides of RNA, we actually have a change in the bases. We still have adenine, guanine, and cytosine, but there is no thymine here. But of course, we still need a fourth base for the pairing. So instead of thymine, we're using a nitrogenous base called uracil. So very, very important point here. If we have a guanine on the DNA, we're going to put a cytosine in our mRNA that we're forming. If we have adenine, we're now going to add uracil. And if we have thymine, we're going to add adenine, right? So that in the RNA, there's only cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil. Something important to remember here is that we have one strand of DNA, which is called the sense strand. Sense, because this is where the actual genetic code, so the sequence of bases, is sort of stored. And then if we want to get to that on the RNA that we're creating, we need to, of course, transcribe, so we use complementary base pairing, on the anti-sense, so the other strand. If you think about it, it's a bit weird and complicated, but it, it makes sense if you think about if you have on the sense strand ATG right? Adenine, thymine, guanine. Then we have on the antisense strand, TAC, complementary base pairing. And now if we transcribe the antisense strand, we get back to the original, to the sense. That's what we actually want, right? With the exception of uracil instead of thymine. So we have AUG on our RNA. And this RNA that we create in the nucleus is called mRNA, messenger RNA. Messenger RNA because we are using this as a messaging tool, getting this mRNA then out of the nucleus to what's called the ribosomes, which is where our next process, translation, happens. So in translation, we are going from our nucleic acid to then a protein. Again, protein can also be called a polypeptide. 
and a polypeptide is made up of amino acids. And the way that we translate is that we take three bases at a time, so a triplet of bases, like the one that we just talked about, AUG on the mRNA, for instance. And each of these triplets is called a codon because it codes for an amino acid. Three bases together, a triplet is called a codon, coding for one amino acid. And so if we have these triplets and we read the mRNA, we can make a polypeptide out of this, having this sequence of amino acids. And that's what we're doing in translation. Translation happens at the ribosomes, which are small organelles that are in the cytoplasm of the cell. There are free ribosomes just floating around and bound ribosomes, which are on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So once we get to our ribosomes, we have moved our mRNA, the messenger RNA, out of the nucleus to the ribosomes. There are two subunits, a large and a small subunit. And the ribosome then sort of attaches to our mRNA to initiate the process. Then we look for a so-called start codon, which is AUG, the one we just talked about. And when we get to the start codon, then we are going to start the process of translation. And this process also depends on complementary base pairing. So you can see how that is a recurring theme and very, very important here. Of course, the question is how do we get the amino acids we want to the ribosome in order to add them together to form a polypeptide in the sequence given by the codons on the mRNA. Well, there's one other actor here that we haven't talked about, and that is tRNA. And as the name already suggests, this RNA brings the amino acid to the ribosome so that we can add the amino acids together and form a polypeptide. The tRNA has what's called an anticodon. So the anticodon is literally just the opposite of the codon on the RNA, so that they can, in complementary base pairing, get together. So for AUG, for instance, the anticodon would be UAC. And that tRNA with that anticodon that can bind in complementary base pairing to the mRNA codon AUG, that tRNA then carries the amino acid that our codon AUG codes for. And so we do that a bunch of times. The ribosome moves along the mRNA in a so-called five prime to three prime direction. And in that process, we are collecting the amino acids brought to us by the tRNA and we are connecting them in a condensation reaction. So the opposite of hydrolysis, splitting is condensation, putting stuff together. And so in this reaction, we are creating peptide bonds between the amino acids forming a polypeptide which is a protein. Just as there is a start codon, there is going to be a stop codon at some point that signals, okay, we're done. We have the gene that was transcribed into RNA. We have now translated it into an amino acid sequence. We have connected the amino acids, so we have our protein. And again, we went from the genetic code stored in DNA, we transcribed that into RNA. So it looks different because we have uracil instead of thymine. And this then transcribed genetic code for that one gene, we have through the messenger RNA sent to the ribosomes and we now have translated it three bases at a time. So a codon at a time, coding for an amino acid. We've added the amino acids together and we're almost done. So this is what you need to know to start with. If you're an SL student, this should be almost enough. Of course, there's always more than I can talk about in these videos. So do consult your textbooks, your teachers for more uh, of the details that, so that you're very comfortable talking about this in your exam. However, if you're an HL student, do watch the next videos that are going to come out on the details. So again, knowing about the enzymes, knowing about some of the smaller processes that are also occurring, which are important, but which you know you don't need to know if you just want to know about the broad strokes of this. So do stay tuned for that. Go back and watch some of the other videos if any of what I said was unclear. And otherwise, I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon for another one of these videos. If you have any questions, just comment below and we'll try to get to those as soon as possible.